So, um, good evening everyone, and welcome to the first Courtauld Museum Debate of 2022. So, um, every year the Courtauld, um, at the Courtauld, the MA Curating Cohort, hosts two museum debates, and we're often encouraged to um, put on a debate that addresses current or topical events in the industry. And we felt that the theme of collectives and their place in the arts institution would be a fitting discussion for this year. So collective action in art has existed for as long as art itself, and it has always carried with it important socio-political implications. From Renaissance workshops training apprentices and collaborating on commissions to the radical interventions in Latin America in the 1960s and 70s, artists' collectives continually demonstrate the merits of group work, be these for material, political, communal, or even logistical reasons. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has only expanded these practices, with the shortlist for the 2021 Turner Prize reflecting a desire to move away from the individual celebrity artist and nominating five collectives working in various mediums. Turned the Turner Prize together this year by the jury member Russell Toby, the emphasis, he said, was on bringing in the community and bringing in the public, bringing everybody in. The debate this evening will centre on this shift, discussing how contemporary collectives have forged their own space alongside the individual artist, how they might survive within or outside of our established arts institutions, and how they connect differently with the audiences of today. We are very excited to have these speakers with us tonight, each bringing valuable perspectives on the topic, and we thank them for coming to share their views. There will be a discussion for an hour or so, I think, and then after, there will be some time for questions from the room, followed by a drinks reception. I'll now hand over to Kabir Jala, Associate Editor of the Art Newspaper and our Chairperson for this evening, to introduce the panel. Hello everyone, um, welcome to this debate and thank you for everyone who's joined us in person and is live streaming. I'm also told that a recording of the talk will be made available in the coming weeks. So my name is Kabir Jala, I'm a journalist and editor and around six months ago I wrote an article titled All in This Together, What Do Art Collectives Mean for the Future of the Art Market? And around that time I was writing the piece Conversations Around the Art Collective were incredibly topical, and I think they continue to be today. So artist collectives, while by no means a recent phenomenon, have seen a sharp rise in interest from institutions, the market, and also the press in the past few years. But why is that? Last year, as Daisy just said, every nominee from the Turner Prize was unprecedentedly a collective. Meanwhile, this year's documenta will be organized by the Indonesian collective Run Rupa, who had themselves invited around 15 collectives, a collective of collectives, to help curate the show. As this debate is organised under the aegis of the MA Curating the Museum course, it will pertain largely to the way in which collectives interact with institutions. And interestingly enough, if you cast your eye around many major institutions today, it is easy to see how the spirit of collectivism is infiltrating museums too. Two years ago, the Vienna Kunsthalle hired a three-person curatorial group, what, how and for whom, to co-lead as directors. The curator Nicola Borio has recently launched a curatorial collective called Radicans, and just this month, the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin announced two new directors to replace Klaus Wiesenbach, a curatorial duo called Tim Felrith and Sam Paderwil. So it is clear to see that the idea of collectives and collectivism is not just restricted to makers, but the wider industry too. But why do art collectives form? What do they hope to achieve? How are they navigating institutions, the art market, and also the inner politics of working as a group? And perhaps most importantly, are they here to stay? So here's past all these questions and many more are three very capable participants, each of whom has a different but very direct connection to the artist collective, which I think makes for a very diverse panel. So directly to my right, up left even, I have a Dr. Rachel Warriner, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Courtauld. Rachel's research focuses on the important contribution of activist collectives to the American feminist art movement during the 1970s. She completed her PhD at the University, of, the University College of Cork on the work of the American artist Nancy Spiro and her book, Pain in Politics and Post-War Feminist Art, Activism in the Work of Nancy Spiro is forthcoming from Ivy Taurus. To her right, I have a member of an artist collective, Tara White, who is part of, an, who is part of a collective called A Particular Reality, which was formed in 2018 by students, alumni, and educators from the fine art departments at Goldsmiths, University of London, and the Kingston School of Art. Her, their work focuses on creating learning environments based upon, sorry, they graduated from Goldsmiths with a BA in 2018, and their practice uses found and fabricated um, objects, such as furniture and heirlooms, 
to address topics around grief and migration, and their collective focuses on creating learning environments based upon values of care and equity. And to their left, the curator Harriet Cooper, who is the head of visual arts at Joward Arts, a leading UK art funding organisation. In 2019, Harriet Cooper launched the exhibition Joward Collaborate, which showcased new commissions by collaborative and collective artistic practices, including a Ray, who won last year's Turner Prize. Harriet has previously co-organized for the De Barlow's Commission for the British Pavilion at the 2017 Venice Biennale, and in 2018, she helped develop a major work not yet at ease by the Delhi-based art group Rax Media Collective for their UK commission, 1418 Now. So, I will now let our panelists introduce themselves more thoroughly, starting with Rachel. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Ooh. Thank you so much for having me um, here, particularly to the MA cohort for the invitation. I really appreciate it and I'm so looking forward to hearing everyone's perspectives on, as you say, this very timely question. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, as has already been said, I'm British Academy postdoctoral fellow here at the Courtauld. Um, my project uh, looks at the ways in which collective activism contributed to the feminist art movement. Um, I'm going to go into more detail in this, about this in a minute, um, but just to give you a sense of some other projects which might help me talk about this as well. Um, I co-founded the Group Work Network along with Catherine Grant from Goldsmiths and Amy, Amy Tobin from Kettles Yard and University of Cambridge um, in 2018. Uh, it involves about 20 scholars working on groups, collaboration and collective practice, sharing work and discussing methodological questions about working together. Um, we've also organised a number of events, including archival visits and talks that look at examples of works made by groups. I came to this area of study because I have some insight into working together from a number of creative and curatorial projects. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in theatre at Dartington College of Arts, which was a programme focused on devising work in collaboration with others. And I went on to do a number of performances after finishing, most of which I'm sure uh, were at best tolerable, um, but it did give me some insight into the processes, stresses and potentials of working with other people. Since wisely hanging up any pretensions of being a performer, I've continued to work with others, both as a poet, also as a curator, um, working with my colleague Sarah Kelleher in the partnership plot projects to curate exhibitions and public programmes. So my scholarly work, um, I'm interested in this, in what makes working together possible and what indeed working together makes possible and how by creating communities, sharing conversations and offering mutual support, real change can happen. My research focuses on the work of three activist collectives, Women Artists in Revolution, the Ad Hoc Committee of Women Artists, and Women Students and Artists for Black Art Liberation, all of whom emerged from the artistic activism that came out of the late 1960s in New York. While different in focus and approach, all three advocated for greater representation for women in the arts, and with women, in the art, sorry, women artists in revolution beginning conversations around gender inequality and acting as part of the wider women's movement, the ad hoc committee taking direct action against museums and establishing alternative modes of recognition for women artists excluded from the mainstream art world, and women students and artists of black art liberation describing and challenging the exclusion of women artists of colour. Their work and membership often overlapped with protests, actions often being co-organized by the three groups. These groups are made up of artists with their own individual practice who shared a specific political goal, goal that is more equal representation of women artists in the art world. Michelle Wallace of Waspel, a women's students and artists for Black Art Liberation, proposed 50% women in each exhibition, of which 50% should be black and 25% should be students. Although some artists chose to make work together, the group work involved in these groups contrasts to the tactics of those involved in the feminist movement on the West Coast and groups like feminist art workers, the waitresses and the lesbian art collective. The West Coast groups pursued direct collaboration in making artworks, often through performance and the development of a group practice. Instead, the projects that emerged from war, ad hoc and waspel focused first on process and then on establishing alternative structures that would allow individual women to build their careers away from the biases of the patriarchal art world, initially in exhibitions like X12 and Modern Art, with slide libraries of women's work, and then in the establishment of all women galleries like the Air Gallery and Soho 20, and art spaces like the Women's Inter Art Centre. Some of my key questions include considering what actually constitutes a collective, how can we understand the influence of collective action on the art world, particularly the institutions of the 1970s, how does approaching individual practice through the lens of a collective influence, uh, the lens of a collective influence our ways of talking about and understanding that work? How did being part of a collective affect the kinds of practices, criticism and exhibition making that, it, that were possible? 
Women artists often describe their involvement in collectives as revolutionary. I'm interested in what this means and how it changes our understanding of key art historical ideas like quality, the canon, and creative work. To conclude, I wanted to introduce an idea that Sherry Gork articulates in talking about her own experience of collaborative work, which is that one plus one equals three. As Gork explains, when two or more collaborate, the result is greater than the sum of its parts. This is a notion I keep returning to for the way it articulates something of the optimism that drives collective practice, the that the opportunity to develop ideas, be supported, and share in the process of making work with another person creates an excess that manifests not only in the work, but also in the community that is formed through shared creative practice. While the realities of working collaboratively can be challenging, work's potentially more difficult to make and a shared vision harder to form than an individual one, the ideal that it represents, that working together creates something that reaches out and builds more than any individual project could, uh, any individual project could, it draws me to collective work. Of course, it's not always political, nor always utopian. Indeed, often it's, shared, it's driven by shared difficulties, whether practical or those based on wider exclusion. I think what Gort captures in this formula, though, is that working together is a gesture that contains within it friendship, trust, and care. All right. And I wanted to start my intro with just a little clip of a video um, that some of our members made. Um, don't know if I maybe made your channel or something. Um, is it this one? Yes. yes. APR is a cross-institutional, educational collective where co-learning is paramount, proposing a different model of learning than the institution commonly provides. It has been likened to an after-school club, a reaction to the institution, but still in relation to it, it addresses art, learning and anti-racism within and beyond practice-based learning. We acknowledge that we exist alongside our history of decolonizing movements in art practice and education that we are constantly responding to and working in correlation with. A black visual art is an innovative expression of a particular reality. A reality set in the framework of specific cultural and historic forces. These are cultural domination by Western Eurocentrism and marginality to it, the experience of exploitation, appropriation, slavery, inequality and racism, and the long and abominable history of colonialism. A black art emerges from this framework and is vitalized by these forces. APR took its name from Yankee's words, the question of intersectional identities and their expression will always be a particular reality, one that presents daily personal challenges to those who are also processing what it means to be marginalized within spaces of majority whiteness. Actually, for artists of color, um, there's such a very real possibility of erasure and invisibility. We consider how futures are envisioned in ways that are inclusive and through which students from many backgrounds can find inspiring role models for their work. I'm working on like the just a little cut. Um back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start with just something visual, um, because as Christine mentioned, I'm a visual artist first. Um, and also a collective member. Um, so yeah, my name is Tara um, and I'm part of a particular reality. Uh, I'll probably use APR, so um, forgive me for that because I'm used to it now. Um, but APR began in 2018 um, when I was a student at Goldsmiths during my BA. Um, and it began out of a connection between um, two tutors, one from Goldsmiths uh, Art Department and one from Kingston School of Art Art Department, and um, Michelle and Joe. Um, and they, they got together and, and were having conversations around 
a concern for their students and a concern for their their students who felt marginalized and um, in turn kind of maybe withdrew um, and found it difficult to engage uh, with you know general class or, or even just kind of collaborating with their peers um, and you know after after discussion and um, between Michelle and Joe um, Michelle wasn't at the time my tutor but had had uh, kind of approached me and, and knew that this was work that I was interested in doing and was aware of my practice as well and and approached me and said you know would you be interested in joining a group if you know we're, we're trialing something um, and I was I was happy to and I was I was really interested and intrigued and really I think one of those images that I sh showed that was like a group of us uh, sitting all in a circle that was kind of one of our meetings at the start and it was just to um, just to sit and eat together and um, to talk about things that perhaps we found challenging um, and it really gave uh, equal space to, to everyone who attended um, and it felt really exciting and it felt like something that we should perhaps continue. It was a slow start because we kind of weren't sure what the trajectory of our meetings were yet, but all we knew that it was, it was a good day. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, as, as things went on, um, we kind of met, met up more um, and, and actually, you know, when things started, when the ball started rolling a bit, that's when the pandemic hit. Um, and so, you know, we, we were planning these exhibitions and kind of opportunities to kind of connect between, you know, people from their own courses didn't, hadn't met each other. And so there was like this, this huge sense of isolation um, for some students. And it became, especially during the pandemic, it became really, really important for us to create this kind of equal stakes coalition between students and staff members um, and later alumni um, as well um, and you know it, we were it was it was really fantastic that we had this really you know intergenerational space that you know it was it was important to us that you know yes we were all connected to the to the institution but it did feel like we were kind of slightly adjacent to it as well because these discussions that we were having were things that uh, didn't really go down well when you were kind of in a crit or uh, yeah in a tutorial, for example. Um, so it was it was it became quite therapeutic as well and, and quite joyful, um, but reflective too. Um, and yeah, so it was really important to us to kind of create this level playing field between students and staff where. They're kind of we we try to dismantle this element of hierarchy um, that that can often be quite exclusionary, um, and yeah, try to rebuild something for all of us that that kind of uh, it, its foundations were mutual respect and and trust for one another, um, which is something that that you mentioned as well. So um, yeah, that's kind of. An introduction and yeah I'm, I'm now uh, an alumni of Goldsmiths University um, and I, I still collaborate with my tutors and the students and I'm still an active member of APR um, and since then it's it's really really shifted the group the group has shifted you know as we've moved out of uh, as we've moved out of the pandemic um, and also more tutors have kind of got on board and um, wanted to be involved you know this it's really it changed the program for us um, and, and also to mention we we now have a space at Goldsmith CCA um, as part of their their kind of learning program that they're trying to develop at the moment um, with a lineup of wonderful uh, you know group of other collectives as well ten other collectives um, and so having that space as well has enabled us to really progress
Before I pass it on to Harry, I just want to ask a quite blunt question insofar as that, what do you as a collective make or you know, produce as artwork? Um, do you, could you define that in any way? Is it, do you consider yourself a solo artist who just happens to be part of a wider collective or do you actually as APR make stuff together, create stuff? Yeah, I think, um, again, it, it, really, it really shifts depending on uh, what feels necessary at the time. So, for example, when we were uh, in lockdown and, you know, we'd had this, this idea to have an exhibition, to, you know, curate this exhibition together um, and also show work, um, actually we'd suddenly become kind of uh, really separate and we weren't able to meet and, and Zoom was our tool. Um, and we decided to make a publication. So online publications were something that we used to kind of communicate our message and also widen widen our, our group and, and, and the reach of, of kind of what we wanted to do. Um, so yeah, it, it really is malleable in that way. And that feels quite important to us as well. And would you like to? I feel like I want to ask questions about all of that. <laughs> There'll be time for that as well. Um, I think it, it's quite unusual to have such an intergenerational collective as well, particularly one where you're starting with hierarchies in place and then you work to and do that. It sounds amazing. Um, thank you for having me. I did have some images, but I was chatting too hard to sort them out, so I don't know if they'll work, but I will um, put them up. I was just going to run them in the background, if that's possible. I don't know if they will automatically move on or not, otherwise you might just end up with a screen of one. I'm not sure I'm going to get it to work, so I will just give you that. Um, uh, so I'm Harriet, um, and as Kavir said, I'm currently working as Head of Visual Arts at Sherwood Arts. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're one of the leading independent funders, and in our work we're really dedicated to supporting artists, curators and producers to thrive, particularly in the early stages of their career. Um, so our work isn't just in the visual arts, we work across art form, and often in those niggly bits in between art forms as well, which is really exciting. And in the visual arts, a lot of our work is centred around supporting artists to make new work and to then present that either in our gallery, which is based in Southwark, or on tour around the UK as well. Um, I joined the team in October 2018. Um, my background before that had involved working in lots of different places, um, particularly in the north of England, so Tate Liverpool and Whitworth and Yorkshire Sculpture Park and British Council. And it was interesting in thinking about this talk, thinking back to some of those roles and where I've interacted work with collectives through that. And the answer is more than I realised, I think. Um, I've certainly worked with collective practices at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, um, at the British Council, a lot more collaborations. Um, but initially, sort of coming straight into my role at Joe Adults, I had just come off the back of working with um, Rooks Media Collective, as Kadir mentioned, on a really major installation. Um, it had been a really interesting process and probably the first time that I had worked very in depth with a collective and really, really seen the individual brilliance and different roles that all three members bring to, to, to that work and, and share wider in the collaborations around that. Um, when I came to Joe, there was opportunities obviously in the Forward programme to think about new commissioning opportunities and I guess a lot of the work that we do around funding and commissioning tries to respond to areas where there's gaps in support. Um, so the visual arts, that could be things like we run an award for photographers um, to support early career photographers to make new work, to be really ambitious, to experiment. And that comes from the fact that in the photography field, there isn't that many awards that are to make work. There's a lot awarded from work that has been made. So as an early career artist, how do you really take risks, take new areas of research or develop things over a longer term um, with proper support, both curatorial and financial? So I think this, in terms of thinking about gaps in, in artistic practice and funding support, I sort of came back to collectives and I worked on developing this exhibition um, called Joe and Collaborate, which is why I've been invited to, to join this wonderful panel tonight. Um, I think I, I studied fine art originally, and from my own background, I know that collaboration was really encouraged during education. It was very much seen as you collaborate with your peers, you work on projects together. But then, in my experience working with artists externally, it really 
isn't supported in the same way, uh, both in terms of funding. I think, you know, funding as collectives and collaborations is a lot harder. In terms of artist fees for exhibitions, commissioning, um, even in our education, if you if you actually work in a collective and apply to do an MA, you're paying multiple sets of fees for that pleasure. Um, so there's a lot of kind of things about sustaining a lot of professional practice as a collective or a collaboration that are really tricky, even though it is very well known that it's a really incredible way of making work. Um, I think that one plus one equals three is exactly exactly right. Um, so in terms of that, I was beginning to think about the limited funding and capacity that visual arts organisations in particular have to work and accommodate the needs of working with collectives. Um, I think fee structures, production budgets, time is a big one. It takes longer to collaborate and building that into project planning is really tricky. Distance as, as well is very like is very tricky and the number of times I've worked with artists in collectives where perhaps they might be invited to do a talk or take part in an exhibition and only one member of the collective can be supported to actually do that or only half the collective. There isn't that sense of being able to bring everyone. Um, at the time I was thinking about this as well, there was lots going on and I think a bit touched on some of this, you know, there was a lot going on. The Turner Prize has had Forensic Architecture nominated, Assemble Win, British Art Show at the time, um, British Art Show just before had had a Baki in there. There'd been a lot in Glasgow International, I think there'd been two collectives as part of that. And Still I Rise was on um, on the second leg at Della War and they had I think four feminist collectives work in that major group exhibition. So it felt like there was increased representation in institutions. Things like, I think, Gorilla Girls had a show, uh, maybe at Whitechapel and Tate as well. So it felt like a really interesting moment. And I think for me, it also related a lot to thinking about alternative education courses as well. And things like Syllabus and Open School East and School of the Damned, which is supporting different modes of developing your practice, but also really bringing collaboration and conversation to that as well. There's also an incredible book which provided loads of inspiration for me um, by Ellen Mara de Vaxter called Co-Art and I would really recommend it. It's interviews with 25 collectives and collaborations and it was, I found it a really interesting read in terms of really thinking through those different models of operating. So that's kind of the context I began developing this idea for the show and just to say sort of roughly what it, what it was is we, I, well, I really wanted to basically create a platform to highlight sort of the incredible energy and perspective and uniqueness that collectives bring to the artistic scene. I also wanted to support those collectives to make work on their own terms, but in a way that was supported um, and developmental for them. So I invited 12 curators who were based in different places across the UK to nominate collectives that they knew um, would be brilliant for this. So early career collectives within sort of the first five years of practice. Um, and I think it's something, it's a way we work quite a lot with artist advisors or with other curators advising to really extend own knowledge, own reach. We are an organisation based in London, although we travel a lot and our staff aren't all from London. You know, I think it's really accepting that there's a lot of expertise and some incredible practice around the UK. We invited all of those who were nominated to submit a proposal for a new work they wanted to make. And from that, I worked with um, two artists who worked collaboratively to select four groups. Um, who we commissioned then to make those works. Each of the groups had an artist fee, a production budget, a budget for their own development, which initially we thought might take the forms of them going on residencies, but actually the collectives chose to use that money really differently. And it felt like a really important part of building that into the project to actually make that space to develop and not just produce work. Um, we also really factored into all of the, the budgets, so travel and accommodation for all collective members for site visits, in-store previews, and budgets for events. I think the money aspect of it is a really important part, and I think it's one of the things that institutions really struggle with. And I, I don't think you know I necessarily got it right at every turn. I'm sure there's things that I would go back and change now, and time as well. I, I think you know more time would have been great. Um, one thing we did try with artist fees is a lot of the conversations I've had with artists are often around money, and it's about money being split. 10 ways when a single artist might receive exactly the same fee. So for the show, we actually decided to give each individual artist in the show a fee rather than a fee to each collective. So there were four collectives, 20 artists, so each of the 20 artists will receive the same fee rather than per collective. Um, it was in, it's interesting, I've not quite reflected on whether it was the right way. I mixed feelings from the artists, but I think, um, it, yeah, it was a really, 
important thing to recognize individual contributions within those. Um, the four collectors made incredible work. Um, I would have loved it to be showing behind, but this is one of them. Uh, this is Kaken and George Jasper Stone. And I think it, you know, we worked with a Ray Collective, who a group of 10 artists from Northern Ireland who won the Turner Prize recently. Kaken and George Jasper Stone, who are based between sort of Cornwall, London, maybe a little bit Berlin now as well. Um, and they're an incredible collective who I would say pulse would be the way I'd describe it. I don't know if they would, but there are three kind of at the core, but they really bring in different collaborators regularly for different projects. So there's this real network that moves. Um, and in all honesty, one of the great challenges I had with the show is we uh, commissioned Kaken and then they wanted to bring in another collaborator on an equal term. And George joined, um, which was absolutely integral, but, but wasn't necessarily something I had anticipated in the way they operated as a collective. Um, we work with Languid Hands, um, an incredible um, collective who work curatorially and artistically, but actually had come through another collective called Sorry You Feel Uncomfortable. Um, the main collective Sorry You Feel Uncomfortable didn't want to put in a proposal as they were on hiatus, but Languid Hands did, and we were able to commission, I think it was their first artistic work. They're, they're currently curators in residence at Cubit. Um, and then Shy Burns, a uh, Manchester-based collective, particularly working in DIY and self-publishing based in Manchester. Um, incredible, brilliant artists um, and friends uh, knew, have known each other since foundation, have flexed and come back together um, and are making incredible work. Um, I have loads that I learned from doing the project and loads of conversations I still have about collective practice and a lot of questions I still have particularly around the markets. I'm really interested to hear um, your reflections on that. Representation, funders, funding. Uh, you know, as a, I work for a funder and we still kind of are improving and trying to improve the way we work with collectors um, and the way that we accommodate that within application processes and funding processes. But it is still challenging. And where I might be working on something where there are 10 spaces on the development programme to give over four of those to a collective practice really changes the nature of that. So it's it's an ongoing kind of conversation that we're still learning from. Uh, residencies and opportunities are still very single-led and education. So I have loads of questions. I maybe, not, maybe don't have enough answers for the debate, but I've got a lot of questions. <laughs> well, there'll be time to ask them and also answer some as well. So there you go, a curator, an artist, and an academic. So before I go into individual questions to you, I want to ask perhaps the most germane one, which is why our collective such a buzzword today if you could maybe give me you know a brief one one and a half minute answer as to why you think that they've in the rise of collective practices is a uh, you know so topical um i think uh, it connects into a fashion for political work i think that's to me that seems to be what's driving it often collectives are assumed to be political whether they are or not that there is a politics to working together and i think that's true that it's a politics with a small p even if you're not someone who's interested in making huge change in so in society but i think um the ones that are particularly championed are ones who are interested in um making political work uh, intervening in uh, questions uh, relating to kind of inequalities i think um, and championing works that have been neglected and so i think that it's, um, it's to do with a wider trend towards an interest in activist political work. That's my sense. Tara? Yeah, I, yeah I, I think I agree with you. I think it's, um, I think often um, groups or, or individuals even are thinking politically without even perhaps intending to. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, you know, it's, I'm, thinking about it in, from a, a university perspective and an educational perspective as well as a museum perspective. But, you know, often um, you, you kind of unpack a lot of uh, issues that, that perhaps feel quite difficult to, uh, to grasp by yourself. And actually talking to people uh, makes that problem feel a lot smaller or a lot less painful to deal with perhaps um and so you know i think i think yeah i think you're absolutely right that you know especially i think it's something we were speaking about just before the talk tonight was you know for students for example who are who are leaving or who are graduating um you know they can often feel like as you said walking off a cliff you know you're you, you don't know where to look next 
Um, and especially if you you perhaps haven't made these kind of this tangible network that means that you're you know have got a, a list of shows coming your way as soon as you've you've you know popped out of uni um and it's just not realistic um and actually perhaps what is more valuable um in the long term is kind of building those friendships and um you know colleagues that you actually really enjoy sharing time with um all right yeah, I think I agree with both of those things. I know there's like a real kind of thing of particularly graduating from art school, like sometimes I think the advice is that, you know, your best thing is to stick with your peer network and to, to support each other. I think the other thing I would say is, I think there's, there's been a slow increasing in platforming for collective work, but I think a lot of the current moment also comes from a recognition that the current infrastructures and institutions in the visual arts need to change. And a lot of that comes back to care representation, equality, diversity, and it is what collective practices are doing outside of arts institutions and outside of the market and outside of, of what might be considered the normal canon. And I think, I'm going to sound geeky now, but I think in your article you'd said something around sort of with the, with the curation of um, Documenta, like one of the things was about, for that collective, it's about creating an infrastructure that just wasn't there. And I think that is something that is a is a conversation that is 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 present now. I think it is about kind of saying actually, I don't necessarily want to work with institutions in that way, and we can do things in our own way. Um, yeah, I think that's still and continues, and maybe more so than recent years. Well, you brought up a very interesting point about um, how they interact with institutions, but I actually want to go to a more um, the primary um, question before, which you were also pertaining to. It's a sort of chicken and egg question insofar as that do artist collectors form because of practical reasons and then do the ideals come afterwards or does it or do the ideals come first and then do practicalities come afterwards or you know is that also a false binary are they very enmeshed so maybe Tara if you want to answer that maybe Harriet also if you want to jump in at some point yeah I think um I think the yeah the point of enmeshment is, is really key I think like you know Obviously, I can't speak for all collectives, but certainly for us, like it was really something that that changed over time, and it was something where, you know, as you said, like we could see gaps. There were gaps, and and people struggled with that, and and needed to find ways of of kind of bridging those gaps. And one of those ways was all meeting together and and talking about it, and kind of seeing what perhaps needed to come about um you know from that feeling um and you know programming that we do now is is really around the that 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 process and that kind of conversation and and just being together in a room and i think you know especially after the pandemic <clears throat> it's um there's there's been a thirst for it and if you give us a space there will naturally be you know there will naturally be production that happens. Um, yeah. If you want to maybe add anything or not at all, I think uh, <clears throat> I think your question to Tara early on was a really interesting one in terms of like, do you make work together, or is it around I ideals and conversation and shared interests? And I think that's really different for different collectives. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of what comes first, for some. It might be that one doesn't come, but for some it may be that, then, you know, particularly I would say more collaborations, two-person collective working, like often that is very led by artistic work um, rather than around ideals um, and a shared, it's generally a shared interest in how you express that. That's a massive generalisation, but I think there are really different modes of collective working and some of that is very much about production, but some of it is very much about coming together around a core a cause or an idea or politics and I think there's it touches on an interesting relationship as well between collective artists who work in collectives who also have individual practices mm -hmm. and how that either ties into their collective practice or not um, I know I certainly a uh, few artists who have mm -hmm. individual collectives which do operate within the commercial market but then their collective work is much freer mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't need to work within those structures mm -hmm. Well, something that you already touched upon is the fact that a lot of collectors who often rise up in um, antithesis or in opposition to the institution and the framework. Rowan Rupert is obviously a really good example of that. They came around in, I think, 98 
um, I think, at the fall of a dictator in Indonesia. And there was obviously no framework. There was no institutions there. And their whole thing was very anti-institution. How, obviously, as a curator who worked within institutional frameworks with collectors, how do you navigate that? And how do you feel that sort of tension, you know? You know? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and yeah, one I was hoping you would ask, because I learned loads about it. Um, we, as part of the program, we did an event called Confessions um, with the artist Wooden Harrison um, and myself. And one of my confessions was that as a curator working on that show, I was really lonely. It is such a different way of working because a lot of the conversations that I might normally be involved with, those exchanges with an individual artist, um, whether that's creatively thinking about space, about audiences, about how things operate in the space, I wasn't needed in those. Like My role was much more facilitation, sort of, I guess, sharing how things could work in the space, but some of that creativity um, that I would hope I bring to those conversations sometimes, artists might say no, um, it isn't there in that same way. So I think it's a really different mode. And I think in some ways that that's one of the slightly tricky barriers that I think you can sometimes, I don't, I don't know, it's happened too much, but I think I can see institutionally it can be challenging not to feel like you're being a gatekeeper or obstructive or saying no to things because actually there's an incredible energy and imagination in the work that's being produced and discussed and those conversations within a collective that then when you bring that to a space and say this is what you want to do can be a little harder to smoothly facilitate without being part of those conversations at that stage. Basically, you generally want to become another part of the collective, which isn't always possible. <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to say, was, and it's something I was thinking about prior to this evening, was, you know, how, what about, obviously, as you said, not all collectives are going to want the same thing from a curator. Um, but I think in APR's context, we would love it, if, you know, if the curator wants to come, come in, right and, them, you know, <laughs> come and, you know, I, 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 I can't speak for everybody, but, you know, the way we work is, you know, put a chair up, you know, and so why, yeah, I, I feel like that would, that would suit our collective, but, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps it doesn't, for, you know, I think, you know, it's something you'd written in your article as well, you know, about this kind of object-based um, output, you know, that's, we, you know, sometimes we may feel like we want to do that. And, you know, as you said, you know, a, a lot of our members are visual artists, you know, they make films, they, you know, I make sculpture sometimes, and, you know, so, and we, we all celebrate each other's individual, individual practices. But we don't separate it from the collective. You know, it's there is opportunity to kind of co-exhibit, you know, or co-inhabit space with all of our objects together. Or there's, you know, a time where we can kind of, um, yeah, create a program, and and perhaps that kind of feeds into it a little bit, or you know, get the curator involved. You know, I don't know. Like, I just. I feel like that could be a really nice way of working. I guess though, there's something about the way groups work where there's a shared language and there's a shared set of ways of working already established where when you're curating, you're going in and you're talking to people and you're sort of developing that relationship together. Whereas like you're kind of coming in as the third wheel being like, hey guys, can I help? But they've already worked out how to do it. Um, which means that there is a kind of a, it's a very different sort of relationship that you're building up, I guess, with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I think you, sorry, I think you touched upon a really interesting point as well um, about how artists, collectives are shaping institutions. But before we maybe touch upon that, I kind of want to ask Rachel about the history of art collectives. Because obviously, when I was researching for this article as well, what I noticed is that even though we're talking about art collectives as if they're a new thing, they're, they're obviously not a new thing. Mm -hmm. And they've existed for basically as long as art has existed. So um, how do art collectives today, you know, look compared to the ones in the 60s and 70s that you were studying basically what are the differences or the similarities yeah i think they're quite similar to be honest i think a lot of the i mean this is partly why i say that they're to do with a, a fashion that it, there's a there's a rhyme there with the stuff that i'm looking at where there are broader po po cultural politics in place and the institutions of art are interested in somehow touching on those cultural politics and then collectives uh, sort of come and they they work with institutions and then they um, also challenge institutions and they help uh, shape uh, the ways in which those things work i think what has changed is museums and as spaces then they have been shaped by the conversations the challenges and the protests that the kinds of groups that i look at 
have mounted, they're also much more open and much more interested in being open than they were in the 60s and 70s, like with education programs being established. Um, like in sort of broad terms um, later on, that's something that isn't really happening in the, in the sort of mo the kind of institutions that are being challenged in the 60s by groups like uh, Women Artists and Revolution, but also um, the Art Workers Coalition. These are conversations that are being brought in. The idea that they should reflect um, the sort of broader constituencies, those are all ideas that in museums are being asked to think about in the 60s and 70s and have thought about, and I'm sure that, I know that there are lots and lots of uh, uh, critiques of the ways in which they do that and um, the kinds of solutions that they've come up to, that the have come up with for the problems raised by activist groups. But still, they're much more interested in thinking about those problems. And I think that's something that's changed. I think institutions really want to bring collectives in to help them think through some of those problems, um, which, um, like museums in the 60s in New York, for example, weren't entirely hostile to. A, a lot of the people who work in museums, of course, um, were largely in agreement with the kinds of issues that were being raised, um, that there should be better representation of people of colour, that women shouldn't be sidelined. Like They were sort of on board, but the kind of institutional structures they had couldn't cope with those things. Whereas now I think it's certainly not perfect uh, by a long stretch, but it's different. There, that has been shifted. Mm. But still, I mean, you look at um, the kind of activism of uh, the Guerrilla Art Action Group, who were an anti-Vietnam War uh, protest group who went into the foyer of MoMA with like uh, bags of beef blood or cow's blood under their, under their clothes and ripped them apart and flooded the, the foyer with blood in protest of the Rockefeller's involvement in uh, making... Um, in the Dow Chemical Company, which made napalm. Um, and it's not madly different from what um, the uh, Payne Sackler group are doing when they're going into institutions and demanding that the Sacklers uh, and their kind of responsibility is taken seriously. So I feel like there are a lot of similarities, um, but that there has been this kind of slow push against the, that the institutions have listened to. Um, but of course, institutions have to move slower. They're not able to immediately change. Is there any acknowledged lineage when you were studying um, art collectives that, you know, an art collective in the 60s would acknowledge a one, you know, back in the 30s, the ones today are very much, you know, trying to honour the collective spirit that came before? I think there's a, a real sense of history now that people have a good sense of people who've come before them, perhaps not a direct canon as such, but that people are aware of people like the Gorilla Girls, for example, they're very widely known about. Um, uh, I think that um, the concept of activism against the museum is a long-standing one and people have a good sense of it. That's, that's my sense of how people feel about it. Um, I think that the groups that I'm looking at felt that what they were doing was quite original. I think that they, because there were certainly collective groups and political groups that had existed forever, um, but the idea of um, the museum, I mean, because obviously museums in the 60s have changed from what they were before, and the art world as a kind of a complex of money and uh, special interests, and um, it's almost there being some antagonism between the art world and the artist, that's really coalescing into a real force in the 60s and 70s. And so I think um, they see themselves as part of the new left. They see themselves as um, mounting a challenge which is about reimagining so the society their parents have given them, even though I don't think that they're entirely right. I think lots of people have done things before that, but um, there's a kind of an energy about the kind of revolution that's being brought, I think, that um, is seen as original. Right. In terms of how artists' collectives are then changing museums as well, because obviously, as you mentioned, the idea of a museum has completely changed in the last 50, 60 years. What we expect out of museums has changed. And you know, perhaps collectives have a large part to do with it, or perhaps they're just part of a wider conversation. So how do you think um, you know, collectives may be affecting things like collecting structures, the way that museums choose their boards, all that kind of practical stuff? Obviously, it's early days. But do you think that we can actually see real change in a museum because of collective practice? Um, may I, uh, or, I or th and yeah, I think somewhat, but also, like, I think, you know, a lot of the big questions that have been raised by collectives are still unresolved. Um, but I think there is a genuine effort, I think, from a lot of people to try and address some of the issues that are raised. Um, but like, it, like anything, like, institutions are big and slow and even if everybody inside an institution agrees that change is necessary that takes a really long time um, so i think uh, there 
is an effort to change things and that they have played a role, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily seen, but I'd be interested to hear what you think. Maybe Harriet, do you want to jump on that? I think maybe two things. I, it was touched on a little bit when you were talking before about education, and I think there's there's been a really good shift of particularly seeing collective practices mainly having their place in education and learning programmes to now being part of exhibitions programmes and their work considered as art. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, a lot of that comes back to the word we've used a few times of energy and discussion and conversation and what that brings to the museum space. And I think institutions are opening up to wanting to hold that space and recognising the need to bring other voices into that. So I think there is change, but I really agree that it is slow. Um, I think, you know, there's some really positive stuff, which I, and I think there's a real direct influence from collective working in this in terms of particularly galleries taking a, a really strong approach to bringing other people into curation of exhibitions, particularly their local communities, and supporting people to actually very strongly engage in collaborative curating. Do you mean commercial galleries when you say that? No, I mean institutions, right. public institutions. So, I, you know, Turner Contemporary, First Sight, the majority of the Arts Council National Partner galleries over the last two years have been working with groups, whether that be school groups, or specific groups in their communities um, to curate shows from the Arts Council collection. And that is increasingly something that time and significant funding and, and real support is going into is saying, you know, how do we bring in collective voices and recognise that that power of conversation and different viewpoints can bring a different viewpoint to the art world, art world that we have in the UK and the art that we see on display. So I think there's some really positive things, but... So. <laughs> As a cynical journalist, I also have to ask, you know, is any of this sort, sort of a gimmick or, you know, to sort of present themselves as a more modern institution? I also think of that, these curatorial collectives that are now directing museums, you know, is there actually any benefit to that or is it just, you know, a new, a new fun thing to do that basically is the exact same as having one person at the head? Such a good question. Um, I think in terms of opening up curation, particularly around working with local audiences and communities, I don't think that's a bad. I think that's a really important thing for a lot of the galleries and really connecting to geography. And, you know, I remember during the pandemic that hyper-localism was the word, but, you know, that conversation about how you can actually have a, a genuinely deep engagement with people and encourage people to have that engagement with art feels really strong. In terms of sort of leadership, I do not know enough about to comment, but... Um, I'm interested to see what happens. I think for visual arts and museums, I think it is different. I think in other sectors of the of the art world, it's not. I think in dance and theatre, in in more sort of artistic collaborations, um, artistic directorships, and I think there's other parts of the arts where that is much more common. And in some ways, that's quite interesting in how museum and gallery sector can learn from that and and see how that can actually really benefit. So. I'd be really interested in other people's thoughts on that because I haven't, haven't seen enough of it to know if it's good. Well, Tara, as a part of a collective that's very much embedded within an institution, do you feel that APR has actually changed Goldsmiths? Or Goldsmiths CC, I don't know, you know, perhaps how connected in terms of... Um, I think, well, I think... I think we need to kind of remember that in, we talk about institutions and actually institutions are a type of collective you know they are a, a lot of people you know in under one roof uh, pre-pandemic maybe but you know and they are effectively a collective that work within much stricter structures than what we are discussing as an artist collective who kind of creates a space for themselves and an or, 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 sorry an alternative space um, and I think something, you know, to think about is, you know, rather thinking, rather than thinking about kind of community art, that is, this is kind of like a strap line that's, that's used and, and recycled quite a lot, you know, how does art practice activate a composition of community? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always bring things back to collage and assemblage and things, that's just how my brain works. But, you know, I think actually kind of... Um, it, it it kind of shifts the way you kind of uh, treat you know art that that centres a community, um, and and also just remembering that like you know sociability is is really inherent in in collective ways of working, 
Um, and so, you know, I think something that perhaps institutions struggle with is, is you know, they forget this sociability and this, this importance that, you know, as, as romantic, romantic as it may seem, you know, kindness and, and care for people. And, and by the way, care doesn't just mean, you know, telling someone they're really nice. It's, <laughs> it's you know, it's paying them properly. It's, you know, giving them time to rest. Um, you know, these really important values that actually, no matter who you are, you need those things. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, I think also, you know, just off the back of what you were saying, like, it's, it's actually something that really strikes me uh, about perhaps, you know, bigger institutions, uh, bigger museums is, is how far detached uh, curatorial departments and learning departments are. You know, they often don't talk to each other. Um, and, you know, as, as much as, you know, I can kind of perhaps understand that when, you know, working in commercial galleries, for example, or, you know, whatever, you can kind of get it because it, you know, there's, there's a profit there that needs to be made. It's ultimately, it kind of turns into a business. Um, but it, it just, it's, it's also, I still can't believe it sometimes, like how they just say, you know, and, um, I think, I think that's a really big issue. And I think that's probably one of the most major issues that kind of stops for any kind of, uh, I guess stops, stops things from, uh, as you were saying, like moving out of tokenism. Um, because, you know, a, a colleague of mine outside of APR once said to me, but it, that kind of created, it created this binary of, you know, curatorial, they don't care about audience. They're not thinking about audience. They're only thinking about how to please the artist. Whereas learning, they're all about audience. You know, it was this really brief conversation we were having. And, um, it, it, you know, it kind of like really hit me. And I was kind of like, oh, that's a bit strong, isn't it? But actually, you know, I think she was, she was quite right. Um, and, you know, I think slowly now there are, you know, in the, in the, in the larger institutions, there are kind of roles, new roles popping up where there's a community curator who's popping up in the curatorial department, but they don't talk to learning and that feels weird, you know? And so there are all these kind of like, um, connections that are trying to be made, but just are getting cut off as well. Um, and I think until we actually, you know, network and actually join up these dots, um, that's, I think, when you know, things will happen because otherwise there's, there's just so many inconsistencies. Um, and yeah, it, it just doesn't make sense to me, <laughs> but yeah. On a practical, oh, no, Harriet, yeah, 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 of um, course. I think, I think you're so right, like particularly for larger institutions are such a, they're so like, um, I did see, I, I think I'm right about this, but I did see a, a big take Liverpool are beginning to, mm -hmm pair their planning closer so having yeah. senior curators and learning and um, exhibitions working together and I have a little bit of experience working when I worked at First Sight that within that we were a program team which was learning and exhibitions and that idea being that you do plan together mm -hmm. really interesting in practice and it, it was quite new when I started and I have to say you know there's some stuff where that works really well we worked on a on a project which was um artists in residence in schools across Essex and then all of that work became a main gallery show. That was an incredible one to work together but there's other shows where it continued to feel like artists and then mm. what, what is the engagement, what is the learning, um, you know, who, what audience, what's the breadth of audience I think in particular. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really challenging thing. I see a few places try, beginning to try it in the last sort of five, ten years and I really hope for it but I think you're right, like larger institutions it's it's really hard yeah. I think I think yeah I, I think you're completely right and I think I've, I've also seen you know kind of let's call it midweight institutions um who uh you know are hiring kind of curators and assistant curators who who work across both mm -hmm. but then you're kind of falling into this trap of overworking people yeah, yeah. and you're suddenly giving you know a team of people's, you know, a collective 
uh, perhaps of, of work to, to one or two people. Um, and then it kind of, you know, it, it stops it stops benefiting uh, the gallery or the museum because, you know, people might even become resentful, you know, I don't know. Because, like, um, Hartman did a really interesting report a few years back about kind of, I can't remember what it's called, but it's about like basically the future of curatorial practice of future curators or 21st century mm -hmm. curators. And it was exactly that in terms of like, there's something, you know, really important about that connection of audience but that expansion of what that role is what, and you know what that means in terms of wanting those roles to do more and get bigger I think you said it really well like maybe we do need more collective practice within that function in the museum because actually I think asking uh, curators to be able to do everything and to engage with every part of it means it just means that the care is lost from that process um, in the way that they work with people and in what's possible um, but yeah, I just remember reading uh, this real expansion of, of what is considered in curatorial practice. And I think, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not new news. I think a lot of people know this now. You need to be able to market. You need to be able to do audience development. You need to probably be able to program all the education stuff as well. Like, it is expected to do more than it had previously. Yeah. But I, I mean, you might know that from your own. I know your, your curatorial yeah, work. Yeah, no, I, I think because uh, we work very much as independent <coughs> curators aren't, like, very like meager funds and without like on the side of institutions working alongside them and for sure it's like because we would plan all of the things to do with our stuff but it's a lot of work and it's um yeah. um it's not particularly well supported um financially um and i think that's the thing i think absolutely it'd be wonderful if you have people who are doing both those those uh things together or if, if shows are being conceived from that um position um but equally uh, in a way where lots of people are doing that together, in a way where work is shared, and because obviously the expansion of roles um, is a real problem across the board. Um, but also, I was going to say the thing about um, kind of institutions. I think we often like it's, talk about institutions as though they're these big monolithic things, but they're obviously really complicated structures where curators often are working on shows that they really want to do, that which they really believe in, and that um, you know people people obviously have things that they need to like agendas that they need to deal with and and it's it's not a, an individual um decision but equally like that sense of um the institution is so complicated and so layered um even in a small institution that um like the kind of factors that are pushing on those decisions are complicated and i don't think this kind of vision of the kind of people who i i research where it's like the institution is kind of hostile to us half the people that they're talking about are also artists they're also members of the group um and like it's a it's a a weird kind of dis a dissonance between the people who work in institutions and what the institution represents, which I think is also a factor. So we have about five more minutes before we open up um, to questions from the audience. Um, before I want to go into futures of collectors, I actually wanted to ask Tara, on a practical level, how do you sell your work with APR and stuff? We've been kind of skirting around the market, talking more about institutions, but obviously, as Harriet mentioned, you know, collectors also need to sell, need to make a living. Most of them are full-time artists. Some of them have an individual, more commercial, object-based practice. And then the, you know, it's more like a, a more like a sword and shield sort of thing where the collector practices their non-grubby side. How do you sort of conceive of yourself as a commercial artist as well, and selling art? Um, I think, I think, uh, I think it's really important uh, to realise that artists and collective members um, are workers um, and I think you know gallery workers you know every, everyone in this kind of system that we're, we're discussing right now they're all workers um, and you know I think AP, APR's aim to date has not really been something to you know we need to we need to sell a nice big sculpture or you know it's not you know it's i think i think collectives really need to be aware of the fact that burnout is a real thing um and so kind of in order to um maintain your energy uh, it's it's really important to you know when you're foreseeing that, that when you <laughs> i don't think <laughs> um, when you're when you're foreseeing that to you know be a potential to to put measures in place to to kind of try and uh, stay away from that um because you know 
trying to find funding is definitely part part of the work um and i think it's uh yeah i think for our case anyway it's definitely you know working with institutions and and, and places to to try and um you know I suppose uh, be supported in in the way of kind of resources and space because that that's what we need. You, know? you don't rely on, for example, individual collectors at all. It's mm -hmm. always institutions that are we, funding the project. We're a, yeah, we, we're self-funded we're, as well. We're a project. We're a project-based um, collective. So you know, mm -hmm. we and obviously, so we kind of we work with the universities, but we also work with with galleries as well. And and really, I think. I think for me, I kind of think about the collective members and, and artists even as, as kind of external contractors. Um, again, maybe that's a bit of a crude way of thinking about it, but for me, it's you know a, a museum or a, or a gallery or a, or a university are, as you said, moving things quite slowly, um, and because their structures are so solid, they may come to us uh, as a group of you know, open-minded or, or kind of knowledgeable individuals who who want to kind of work around around these structures and perhaps kind of loosen them a little bit. Um, and so in that way, maybe you know, maybe we're external contractors, but I, I don't think that kind of changes us uh, in a way of you know, we're we're not non-artists. We're all we're all artists, but we work just like other artists do. You know. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does, it does. Um, so on the topic of the futures of art collectors, I thought we could start with Rachel, because obviously it's really interesting to also look at how art collectors have lasted from the 60s and 70s. You know, how are, are they long-lasting, the ones that you've studied? At what point do they disintegrate if they have? And, you know, in terms of the legacy as well of them, is it that individual practitioners still carry, carry on with the practice? You know, one person takes on the torch. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the collectives that I study, almost all of them last less than 10 years. I mean, one like some of them last a year um, and then disappear. Um, but th they kind of, they don't really end. They kind of, as you say, kind of subsume into people's individual practice. They inform how people um, think about their work, how they contextualize their own sense of who they are and what they want to do. They help create alternatives to existing galleries and museums. I mean, one of the things that I'm really interested about with um, all of the, the groups that I study is the fact that they essentially just um, kind of bypass what's already there and set up their own structures. They set up uh, like uh, the Air Gallery and Soho 20 and Artemisia, all these all women galleries set up to represent women artists and just basically say, we're not we're not having any question about whether women can be artists. We're um, setting up alternatives. And the Air Gallery is still going, for example, um, as is Soho 20, I think. Um, so like, they, the collectives are like these big bursts of energy that then fuel something in not just individual practices, but communities, the, the, the communities, the friendships, the partnerships, um, not just um, between artists, but also uh, like curators and critics. Um, uh, directors are people who who all are coming up from that energy of those conversations and those kind of mutual networks of support. Would you say it's unfair to say that they, in a way, are designed to expire at some point and then? I mean, turn into again, else? there's so many, so many things that can be called collective, and some of them are so long-standing. I mean, you can call, as you did, Gilbert and George, a collective. Um, you know, and they've obviously had quite a long run. Um, but, uh, you know, other things are have sort of come up and gone because the energy and also working together, people fight and people fall out and people sometimes weren't that good friends to begin with and they find out that they're really not suited to working together. Um, so, like, there's a lot of tension and antagonism within groups, but also um, there's something like the energy and the potential of, of the ideas that they're working with, which I think drive things. And also, I think... Um, the other thing, the, the reason I came on to looking at these groups was because I did my PhD on Nancy Spiro, and her involvement in Women Artists and Revolution particularly is something that comes up again and again as a kind of basis for her practice, but also it kind of makes it cool in the context of an art world where political practice and activism are fashionable. So there's also that element of the way that stories are told and the way that we as art historians tell stories where we're um, pulling on that kind of work with particularly activist collective um, practice that that adds some kind of uh, political element to something which maybe 
like rich, enriches the way we look at it or also makes it seem more relevant to today. So I think there's all those factors. It's interesting as well that, I mean, around the time of these artist collectives, the idea of artist contracts, for example, the professionalization of the art world really wasn't there to the same extent. Mm -hmm. There was an artist duo called Broomberg and Shannon, which recently um, broke up about two years ago, um, managed by Goodman Gallery, and that is actually going and splitting contracts like a divorce. It's so interesting. They monetized it well, though, with the kind of they sort of did. testament. <laughs> I gave them a lot of press, actually. So, you know. I thought it was yeah. really interesting. Um, well, same question, I guess, to you, Tara, about the future of our collectives. Are they here to stay? And, you know, how long do you also envisage, envisage that APR will last for and in terms of even things like contracts for example how do you decide who's in APR how big the group is you know all that kind of stuff do you have to sign anything to do it? Uh, I mean yeah, when funding comes our way of course um, but I think yeah I mean I just yeah reiterating that you know putting those measures in place when when you kind of know that that burnout could be could come your way um, is really important to kind of the sustainability and the longevity of your your practice together, um, and you know, I, something that I I personally really love about how APR works is that we kind of have this sort of tag team effort, where you know there's this there's this trust between us that you know we know that if someone needs to step out for a little bit for whatever reason that the collective is still going to be running because we all know what needs to happen and what we're there for kind of thing. So, you know, someone can tap out for a bit and it, the cogs will still be turning. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of allows us to, to spread the workload and it allows us to kind of continue regenerating ourselves and adapting and, you know, responding to circumstances. And I think, I think it's something quite relatable to most people in the pandemic as well, just, you know, trying to figure out what is needed when. Um, but yeah, we, I think something, also something you mentioned, I've made a note about the kind of flexing and pulsing of groups mm -hmm. is, is something that I definitely think we relate to as well, is that, you know, then for us, there needs to be this kind of necessary porousness, uh, you know, that I guess, that the borders around what APR is, is, is porous and, and, you know, there's this free flowing kind of movement of people and, and you know, sharing of, of time. Um, and yeah, I think that that flexibility will, will allow groups to, to just keep going. And if, if that feels right to them, mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, it's, it's so personal to the, to the group. So. Harriet, same question. Little to add, I think that summed it up really well. Um, I think there's so many different modes of collective working. Um, and it really depends on, on that, on, on how that works. If, you know, if that collective can change over time, if it is flexible, if it feels good. If Gilbert wants to leave Gilbert and George, that ain't going to continue. <laughs> so, you know, there's really different models. I do think, I optimistically hope for the wider infrastructures of the art world will continue to make steps to make it easier because I think it's hard work being in a collective practice. Like it is, it takes more time and there's so much value and brilliant stuff that comes from it, but there is time, there is energy, there is burnout. Mm -hmm. And it can often, I think, feel like you're, you're trying to have conversations that are hard with institutions who don't want to respect the way that you work as a group. So I think there's an element of sort of funding, market, how these things can adapt and change to actually support collectives mm -hmm. to develop and thrive and yeah. to give them opportunities to actually <coughs> spend time. I, I remember, I think was it maybe 2019, Wising Art Centre dedicated their whole year's residency programme to collective practices, to inviting either existing collectives to hold the space or for artists who wanted to collaborate for the first time. And it, and it needs things like that. It needs, the art sector needs to give time and it needs to give money, and it needs to give space if they truly value yeah. collective practice. But I am interested in, um, you know, also what that means longer term in the market. And I know that's an area you probably have a lot more knowledge on, but I think, you know, even if you look at representation of some of the major commercial galleries in London, like 
I mean, it's one collective, it's three collective at most, yes. most is zero. And also very small as well. You don't get the wide ranging ones, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they always British have material. Art show this year has one yeah. collective Christmas yeah. actions. Like, it is still like, mm. in terms of market and actually what it takes <clears> to create a professional path as an artist and how you finance that. If you're not coming from a position of means, it's, it's a really hard path still. That was actually, you know, not only was it unprecedented for the turn of price to not have all collectors, but it was the first time that there were no commercial gallery representation as well, which is mad when you think about how they normally buoy up the price as well. My last question to you is if Nicola Borio comes knocking, will you join this collective of curators? Have you caught the bug? Uh, I don't know how good a collective member I'd be. <laughs> Interesting. Well, um, I think that's um, quite for this section. If any of the um, audience would now like to answer, ask some questions, even get a microphone. Any any hands? Yes, over there. Would you mind? <laughs> Probably shout. Right? Oh yeah, I guess you could also just shout. Yeah. Um, you you obviously, I mean, traditional audiences for art are kind of um, plated to the idea of art as an expression of an individual. And you mentioned, obviously, the institutions are still resistant to the idea of collectives. And I assume that's because they're a harder sell. Is that, I was wondering, how, is, that your, is that your experience when you've been working with institutions and putting on shows? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think, I think it is the case, you know, I think so much of the myth we build about art is still around the artistic genius. It's still based around that individual uh, kind of having this unprecedented tap into creative genius that, that you know, isn't a shared thing. And I think interesting, I guess, when with something like Joe would collaborate, I guess, because it was a group show of collective work that's in itself almost provides its own uh, marketing. Um, but I think it can be really hard to grasp and to promote and to, for people to, I think, I think it is a thing where sort of being able to put a kind of a name, face, and knowledge to an individual maker behind work is still something that is difficult to grasp. Um, Can I just add into that? I think also a lot of the time, the way that these things are marketed, it's as though the collective was an individual. I mean, like if you like thinking of the Turner mm -hmm. Prize, you go in and it's like this is the Array Collective's work, um, as though that was. So it's sort of like it yeah. takes that place, and I think that a lot of the time. Um, institutions and like art historians as well it's really hard to tell a story which is about a relationship as opposed to a particular history and that's how the histories are often written as well as like the collective did this the collective did that as though it just sort of takes that place and the story that's told is essentially identical to the one that you would tell about an individual artist it's just um, you you put the name of the group where you would put the name of an individual artist I think a lot of the time um, but it's really hard to do anything else because like you can't say, well, the first of the 10 people is like this. And then, you know, the war text would just be un un uncontrollable. So I think like the ways and the methodologies for doing that are, are really complicated. Would you like to add anything or should we go to the next question? Um, I mean, yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, I, I agree it, it's something that is not, not quite uh, something that museums can, can kind of grasp without kind of projecting some sort of indi individualism onto it um, just because it's more palatable or more kind of um, you know having yeah as you said like having to kind of imagine okay how many people were involved in this but you know actually thinking I guess this kind of idea of collectivism also kind of thinks you know you, you think about how many people are involved in putting on an individual artist's exhibition. You know, I used to work as a fabricator where I manufactured very expensive artworks. And the hours and the work that went into it, and then I went on to installing artworks, and you know, and then there's a whole gallery full of people who make those, you know, and when you're, you know, do you talk to, you know, you do go down to the cleaner, you know, the the you know, the detail of the space. Um, and you know, is that a collective? And that's kind of, maybe that's what I was kind of referencing when I was talking about the museum or the institution as a collective. It's kind of like, you know, how everyone's an author somehow, you know, and, and, and kind of, I guess, thinking about the gallery as this kind of 
arena of responsiveness or you know this kind of um i guess again maybe it's slightly romantic but kind of this this space that so many people have had to be involved in to to kind of make this thing happen um but by the end of it only one person's name is on is on that so i think i think this idea of collectivity is is really trying to 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 bring that to light more um I think that's so important to sort of keep central when you're thinking of that question of like, do collect will collectives uh, sort of remain and how long do they last? It's the fiction in the art world is of the individual artist who creates something on their own and then it appears on the wall of the tape. That's not how anything works. Like it's a story that we're all really wedded to and it's one that um, has driven a lot of how art works. And it's interesting, as you say, to think of theatre and, and music, which we don't need that one story in quite the same way. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The idea that um, the artist is some kind of like hermetically sealed individual um, is is the the fiction of the art world. It's not the collective the collective and creative practice and supporting each other, collaborating on things. That's how anything gets done. That's how any any kind of work happens. I think it's interesting as well in, in terms of what you touched on for artist studios. Um, I mean you go back to sort of, you know, Renaissance art history and, you know, it is studio collectively makes things. It's still the case now, but it is still the hermetically sealed uh, artist name on the door, never mind the 25 people who are actually maybe fabricating and creatively designing some of those works. Yeah. And as soon as it's studio off, the price halves quarters. Uh, but um, I think it's actually really interesting as well that you sort of touched upon with the idea of performance and dance that museums also are changing the way in which they view value of the individual genius because actually the monographic exhibition isn't the, quite the money draw that it used to be. Obviously it's still more, it, it brings in more money than a group show is, but now museums are really turning towards things like experience, the gift shop, the, you know, the cafe and stuff. What we ask of a museum is also shifting. So I think, again, just popular taste is pro probably also making the idea of the individual genius maybe less important, but yeah. Yes? Following on from that last question, I mean, you mentioned the market a few times, uh, and, and, uh, and also the reluctance of commercial galleries, perhaps, to, to uh, engage in collectives. And it might be a question for you, because you, know, you work for the newspapers, where it's a keen eye at the, the, the market, whether you see or foresee uh, uh, the market collectors embracing uh, collectives or uh, some sort of structural resistance. I definitely do. I think that, you know, no art market exists in a vacuum. And I think that what's also happened is that performance has become a much more viably collectible um, avenue, as well as the ephemera around performance, which is obviously one thing. I dare to say NFTs actually might also have a part to play in the idea of collecting things that a collective makes. Obviously, there are reasons that, you know, a collective wasn't commercially viable in the first place because you really need that provenance, right? That's why people will pay millions for a work because they can point to it and say, that's by so-and-so and that's why I paid a ridiculous amount of money for it. Um, I think that what you're seeing is, you know, other ways of collecting are therefore coming up and as a result, collectives are therefore being able to sort of fit themselves into it. I don't think that um, there's been a huge rise in appetite for collectives in the market. I just think that there have been more emergent markets and therefore collectives which have very broad, you know, diverse sort of practices have been able to sort themselves into them. And also, I mean, galleries themselves are also changing as well. They are becoming more receptive and less top down to what the market needs as well. I think before the model was very much, they would present work and they would say, this is excellent. Um, the collectors have a much bigger say now in terms of what's shown at a gallery, you know, arguably in a bad way, they have a lot more pull in what we see in the world, what the market shows, so, yeah. Also, just to say, I think it's also worth sort of registering the fact that a lot of people who work collectively don't want market recognition, don't want institutional mm -hmm. recognition. Um, and they, like we've talked a lot about institutions particularly, um, but also the market. I think a lot of people come together to work collectively because they don't like those structures and they think art should do something completely different. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be part of the tape. They don't, they don't want to be sold. They want to create a kind of utopian existence which is about as something outside of those structures which are seen as kind of um, corrupted somehow. So I think it's also worth registering yeah. that one of the reasons perhaps that they're not as collectible is that they just don't want yes. to be the yes. agency of that as well. Um, yeah.
Well, you know, actually, in that Ruben Rupert talk, um, they gave it a freeze uh, six months ago. We, we was talking about it. They propose this idea of the limbing, which is what their documentary show is about. And it's basically taking the idea of a collective rice bond and um, trying to transpose it onto the art market. And that whole thing is that all the artists in the commercial gallery should share the profits evenly, which is obviously a nuts concept to a market journalist. But that's a sort of collective spirit that is then, you know, trying to be seeping into the market, whether that will work. Probably not, but right. yeah, there are conversations. <laughs> I, I really loved that idea. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm quite interested in maybe less from independent collectors, but whether national collections uh, begin to take more of an interest in representing what's happening in the in this last decade, yeah. in particular in the UK. Um, I think it is something we might see more going into museum and gallery collections than individual. Um, I was telling someone recently, and like, I was at um, Emo in Dublin a uh, few, maybe last month, and um, they've just done a really interesting collection rehang. And, and one of the pieces there was a, a piece that was made collaboratively, I think within an education group setting, by an artist with a group of survivors of domestic abuse. But it was collected in 1998 for the museum collection. And I thought that was quite forward looking in terms of it likely being something that had been within a more outreach and education program than the main kind of exhibitions program, but it being about a collective practice and a collective coming together of creativity. Um, I wish I could remember the, the names, but um, I, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Anecdotally, actually, I was in the Reina Sofia in Madrid about three weeks ago, and they've also done a massive rehang, and obviously their collection um, strategy is one of the most forward in Europe, but about 25% of the works in the 1990 to 2010 um, are by collectives or not by an individual artist, and it's mainly... It's, I protest ephemera, video art, all the kind of stuff that maybe wasn't being collected by major institutions before, which I go, goes back to the original point that institutions are just more willing to collect works that aren't paintings and sculptures, and it turns out that collectives make quite a lot of them. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. yeah I was just thinking, um, there's quite a lot of parallels with the sort of business and corporate world, and that you know, collaboration has become the buzzword the last uh, decade or so, partly because people want to work together and be more inclusive, also because it ends up sometimes with much better work. But in a corporate setting, you can get a facilitator in to sort out differences between individuals, which is often what derails things. So how do collectives go about doing that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, it, it, it depends on context. Um, but I think, I think, it's about really trying to, you know, as a collective, you you under, you know, you're you don't kind of move as one one body all the time. You know, it's, you know, I think we realise that you can't always work collectively all of the time. However, it's important to from time to time because actually, you know, the ex exponential growth of of your production with collaboration is you know is much greater um and so you know fortunately we haven't had something as dramatic as, as what you just described um but you know it's i think you know really just realizing that you know you're you're a group of individuals who who in our case you know we're friends as well um but also there's this wider group of us that you know some of our group have, have worked, you know, I, I, I don't study at Goldsmiths anymore, but, you know, some of our group are tutors. And so they are meeting a new generation of students who they form a relationship with, but I don't necessarily have a relationship with those students. So, you know, it, it's, it's a web and it's, it's a, you know, there, there are, uh, like any kind of group, you will have people who, are closer to each other and who have known each other for longer than others. And I think that's quite a natural way that people behave. Um, and I don't think we're, we're kind of trying to force any kind of false thing of we all have to, you know, move forwards at the same pace. And, you know, it, it's really this kind of very organic uh, grouping of, of people who who enjoy working together and and you know if if someone feels that they have 
better knowledge of how to tackle something that's come our way, we kind of, you know, we listen to each other, you know, because um, because some of us will know more about certain things than others. And, and I think that kind of entering that space and, and I think that's something um, that I kind of relate to what you were saying about, you know, feeling like the third wheel in a, if as a curator joining a collective, you know, and I think it's really important to just be quite honest about what it is that, you know, how you work and, and the real kind of route to why you're all there. You know, it came to us, it, in kind of a couple of years in that you know we had we suddenly had this tagline of art learning anti-racism because that was just what we wanted to do and that was that was the focus of our work and and we all had this this kind of collective desire to to make things um to improve things for each other and and i think you know i think it's important for us that as as generations of students go on and you know as students leave university and, and want to start working with galleries and perhaps join the kind of you know more of the kind of curating side of things then you know this legacy that we kind of create isn't we're not, we're not kind of backtracking you know we're constantly kind of laying down some some foundation that continues to get built upon so um hopefully that that kind of takes us in this forward trajectory. So, um, yeah. Would you guys like to add anything to that? I mean, that sounds like a really lovely and considered thing. I have to say that historically, it's not always quite that grown up. Um, there's lots of things, lots of people implode in really extreme ways, and there's sort of cases. There's, well, there's cases where people run off with money, and there's cases where couples who are at the core of a group split up, and then there's this disastrous fallout where the group is kind of torn between two things. And um, there's all sorts of like really, like like lots of people falling out and hating each other, and it, it becoming really dramatic. But um, yeah, I think this model sounds much better <laughs> i think it's also that we all have quite a clear idea of what we what we don't want it to look like um and you know i've we've i've had i've you know had experiences of you know drama like that you know and with the, have kind of people running off with money and things and you know, you just kind of think, do I want to continue, you know, be, and, and that's fair enough. Um, some people do, and, and that's okay. But I think, you know, with, with APR, we're very, very, everyone knows why we're there, you know. Um, and it's it's not something that we're, we're trying to kind of profit off. It's, it's, you know, obviously it's very, we need funding to, to kind of care for each other and ourselves and our audiences. Um, and yeah, we, we know we know what we don't want. So, um, yeah. um, did that answer your question? Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? I actually thought I was going to say though, um, it kind of touched upon something as well that we consider the collective practice again to be a bit of a monolith that is also unchanging over time, and that collective practices in the sixties are you know sort of have the same principles and the same things, but obviously collectives learn. From one another in that way they improve in the way that artists also improve upon themselves they look at the art world that they don't want but they also look at collective practices that they don't want is that something that you've also considered you know looking at where collectors in the past have gone wrong and thinking we can do it do it better basically i mean i guess so i think i think because uh you know it's it's come about from a frustration with the institutions that we were connected mm -hmm. with it was very clear to us that you know i think a question that isn't doesn't get asked enough is like what do you need you know and we were discussing this is like what what do you need to to feel like you can kind of uh produce and and you know be content and and cared for yeah. um and so that that really was you know it, maybe it sounds a bit too simple but you know that's what it that's what we were there to do and you know as we went on and we kind of wanted to program more you know it became clearer that you know funding we do need to reach out for funding and we need to kind of there are these certain kind of parameters that we need to kind of like dip into um and so yeah i, I 
don't know if that answers the question, but it's, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't I mean, also to just add in for the, the groups that I'm talking about, we do have 50 years worth of history to look back on, so we know the implosion of all of them. Whereas, like, hope, hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> I'm not, not wishing that, but you know, it's like we, we've got the end of the story as well, right. which perhaps we haven't for c current ones. And it's actually completely reasonable sometimes to just fall out and, co and collapse and say no more, I think. Well, uh, on that ominous <laughs> note, I think that's time for the close. Um, unless there are any other questions from the audience, no? All right, well then, thank you so much to uh, the Courtauld and to the Emmy Curating the Museum panel for, um, sorry, um, cohort for having us. And thank you to my panel as well. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you.